Okay, in today's episode, we're going to talk about navigating inspections and repairs. I've had this come up so many times with agents who really, for the last two or three years, haven't had to deal with this. Um, it was a COVID market. We were doing as-is uh, property sales, and so um, you know people weren't asking for things to be fixed, and now they are. So we're going to talk about having to, uh, or, or how we're going to navigate those things in the uh, months and years to come. So uh, stay tuned. Welcome to the Agent Bridge Podcast. I'm Brandon Baca, Marine Corps veteran and 15-year realtor, broker, and coach. And I'm R.L. Hessen. I'm a Fortune 500 C-suite executive, real estate investor, and entrepreneur. The Agent Bridge is the proven path to real estate success without the burnout. Okay, episode 28, Navigating Inspections and Repairs. Um, Guys, make sure you like and subscribe. Um, We're we're getting... um, We're getting a lot of uh, good feedback from you guys. We appreciate that. Um, We're getting a lot of new subscribers. We appreciate you guys um, hanging out. We had an event uh, last week. We had some folks from that, uh, from our podcast, uh, uh, fans of a podcast come to the event. So that was cool to visit with them. So we're excited about where this is going. And again, let us know, comment, let us know what we can answer for you. Um, Or if you uh, liked it, just let us know. Okay, so let's get into... um, well, first, we need to do our market update. What do you got for us on market update today? Not much. Uh, today, um, as of the release of this podcast, we don't know yet, but today is the CPI index data for the month of April. Um, so we're going to see kind of what um, some of that, the consumer price index data looks like. Mm-hmm. And that could have a decent effect or, or possibly a bad effect. But I think most people think it should have a good effect on the rates to come for the next few weeks. Okay. Um, I think... We'll see that inflation, or hopefully we'll see that inflation has slowed, um, mm-hmm. maybe slightly more than we expected, which would be good news for uh, mortgage rates. Mm-hmm. So, what the other thing that's been interesting through all of this is unemployment is really low. Really? So that's had a fifty-three year low. Yeah, so that's had a major effect on um, inflation. So as as the jobs data comes out and we see this really low employment rate and companies are strong and they're hiring, um, you know, the Fed sees that as like, hey, we got to put more more pressure on this market so they continue to raise interest rates. And again, the Fed does not set the mortgage rates, but yeah. the mortgage rates um, fluctuate based on data that comes out. And so, um, yeah, so that, that's been strong. Um, inflation's still been stubborn. So Mm -hmm. uh, we think that this last 25 basis point hike was possibly the last one for a while. Mm -hmm. People were thinking before, though, that we might see some rate cuts, and I don't know that we'll see that. Um, Nothing substantial anyway for a little while? We could. I don't know. So that's kind of what we kind of hope to find out a little bit more today is what does it look like for the future? Um, But rates as of Monday were like at a three-week high, so... Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully this, uh, this data that comes out today is, is helpful, but really, you know, this is not in some senses it is, but we have a huge inventory problem. Yeah. Hopefully if the rates come down in the fives, you know, people want to sell that are stuck that that have that 3% right now, but until we have an inventory, um, increase, we're, we're going to have this situation where there's not a lot of buyers. So. Yeah, no, I know. And we're seeing a lot of that and we're still seeing multiple offers, which is why we talked about multiple offers last week. If you haven't listened to that episode, go back to it. Um, because we talk about how to win once you are writing an offer. So uh, we're still seeing a lot of it. Okay, well, let's get into the content here. Um, navigating inspections and repairs. Again, you know, we, we haven't really dealt with this. And so now it's coming. We, I've got experienced realtors that are coming to me going, hey, how do I handle this? How do I handle this? And so it's interesting for me because I'm thinking like, well, you should know this by now at this point in your career. But if somebody's been doing this less than three years, we really weren't dealing with a lot of repairs unless it was, you know, something substantial. But um, yeah, now you've got an, it's another negotiation point, which uh, in previous markets, this is where the deal falls apart is on the repairs. And a lot of that is due to, you know, people not, preparing their buyers and sellers for the inspection time frame. And so um, what I will say or what I'll lead in with is make sure you're talking to your buyers and your sellers about how this works. And don't say it once. You need to say it at the beginning, like when you're doing that initial consultation, but you need to say it again as you are within a day or two of the inspection period because 
um, they're going to forget. Uh, and they're going to be asking you a bunch of questions about how this works and they're going to get scared. And um, it just becomes a point of contention for buyers and sellers. So get ahead of it with conversation about how this works. Yeah. I mean, a lot of buyers don't actually know about this process at all, especially first time home buyers. They don't even realize that you can ask for right. someone or negotiate um, a repair amendment. So it can be a surprise that's important to get it out of the way at the beginning just mm -hmm. to understand what the process is and, and uh, how you approach it. Right. So make sure they know how it works and we're going to talk about how it works and make sure that you remind them of how it works as we go in. I'm, I'm working with um, a client right now who actually is my mother-in-law and I, I'm having to do the same thing with her. I'm having to stay ahead of it, right? Because she's coming back with questions on like, how does this work? Even after we've had all these conversations. So it's just, it, there's a lot of fear around it, a lot of anxiety around it. And the more that you can create uh, communication around it, the better. Um, so let's talk about, first of all, what an inspection is and how do we handle or, or navigate the inspection. So basically, a the buyers are going to have a home inspector come and they're going to go over through the whole house with a fine tooth comb. They're going to find things that nobody even knew existed that were problems. Um, and they're going to write a, a, a report with hopefully with pictures that show you where those problems are. Um, but they're going to cover every single thing. They're going to flush every toilet multiple times. They're going to put stress on the water. Uh, they're going to notate if it's uh, low water pressure or high water pressure. They're going to, you know, there are all of these things in the house that they're going to point out that you're not even thinking about. And so sometimes, you know, you'll hear back from sellers. They're like, I, why do they go through this with like, they feel like they're being nitpicky. It's like, no, that's just what an inspector does. Yeah. That's their job, right? Is to work on behalf of the buyer to give the condition of the home. Most inspectors will tell you that if a new buyer moves into the house and they notice all these small things that weren't mm -hmm. on the report, they're going to wonder, hey, what were the big things that this person missed? Right. So they go through this house as if they were going to live there with mm -hmm. a fine tooth comb or any of the door, you know, knobs loose or, you know, all mm -hmm. these things. And they're going to notate it because they want you to know, hey, they were thorough and they gave you a good inspection of this home. That's right. So um, so what's the inspector looking for? You know, they're looking for, they're just going to basically take an objective uh, stance on everything, all, on the systems of the house and are they working or not and any sort of maybe deferred maintenance items. So here's, but here the question is, what are you looking for as uh, as the agent? And so what you're looking for is, I put these in two categories. One of them is major repairs, okay? The other one is deferred maintenance. Now, I'll bet for 90% of you, if I go into your houses or your apartment or whatever, I'm going to find some deferred maintenance items. I'm going to find a leaky faucet. I'm going to find a, a toilet where you've got to jiggle the handle. I'm going to find, um, I mean, any number of things yeah. in, in a house. You just have defer. even, you know, the, your house, you have a new house. I'm sure you have maintenance items that come up from time to time Absolutely. and that you okay. haven't messed with yet. Yeah. So your those deferred maintenance items are going to be there. That is not really what we're looking for in an inspection or, or in terms of like uh, negotiation. Yeah, they'll be notated, but not, not something we're after for anybody to fix. Right. So what we are looking for is uh, the major repairs. We're looking for, and I'd like to break these down into five different categories of what we're looking for. Number one, structural. Do we have any major structural issues with the house? Um, number two, is the roof insurable? Is it Can, can it be insured? Um, is it in good condition? Can it be insured? Number three, do we have any major plumbing issues? Uh, number four, any major electrical issues? And number five, in like air conditioning, which because that's a very pricey, if there's something that's uh, going on with the air conditioning that, and you have to replace it or something, that, that can be a very expensive deal. And here's what you're going to have to understand. If there are any of these major repairs, and this is what I tell client buyers, especially, I said, if there are major repairs, the sellers are going to have to fix them anyway to sell the property. That's right. Um, or they're going to come down off the price a ton to remedy this issue or for someone else to have to go through the trouble of fixing it. So yeah, if you've got an air, con they're not going to be able to sell a house with a broken air conditioner um, to to most buyers. Yeah. So you just have to know like when the, when you're kind of going through that, especially with the buyers, it's like, Hey, look, if there's anything major that turns up, great. You're going to find out about it and we're going to get that fixed and you don't have to worry about that later. 
Yeah, the only um, category I would add is safety concerns. And the only reason I would add it, um, well, one, because it's a safety concern, but two, because it could pop up from a lender that you have to repair that right. uh, before you are able to uh, close on the home. So yeah, safety. Exa exactly. But uh, th this bears saying, though, a lot of this is going to have, a lot of the success or failure of your contract at this point is really going to depend on the quality of the inspector. Okay. Now, if you're on the sell side, there's nothing you can do, right? You you can't control it. If you're on the buy side, you need a relationship with a fantastic inspector. And what you're looking for is someone who um, is knowledgeable, um, who is, you know, not knowledgeable and competent, but has good, uh, a good demeanor, like good bedside manner. That's right. When dealing with clients, because this is where everybody's really scared. And if you've got, you know, an inspector that's a drama queen, they'll kill the deal. Yeah. They need to say anything could be fixed. I'm right. here to, to notate what the issues are, but anything could be fixed. Not to say, I wouldn't buy this house. I've had those, though. I've had inspectors that be like, I wouldn't buy this house. Or, you know, if you, uh, you know, that break breaker could short and burn the house down. This like, one's well, going to be it. a headache. Or, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. And inspectors will be quick to tell you in, in most cases, I guess somebody could be a licensed contractor, but they're going to be quick to tell you, hey, I'm not a licensed contractor. I'm a yeah. licensed inspector. Right. And let's say HVAC comes up and they notice something. They're going to say, hey, I'm not licensed to repair HVAC, but this is what I notice. You need to get this um, looked at by by someone who works on HVAC. So. Right. They're, they're going to point out things, too, that, that they may not be able to tell you exactly what's wrong, but you need to have someone else come in and look at it, So that especially if they fall in one of these five categories. If it's missing switch plates or something like that, they're not going to farm that out to a contractor. But in one of these big categories, that could, that could absolutely be you might need to have a licensed plumber, licensed electrician, all these things. Right. So, yeah, having that uh, great inspector that's basically what, what should happen is uh, when you're working with the buyers, you should you should have an inspector that becomes basically a part of your team. That's right. Right. They're there to help you, to give your clients guidance and um, help you get the deal to 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 closing. Okay. Um, now here's another one that I brought up. Uh, what what do you do when dad shows up? Right. When the buyers. I find out when dad's available and I and I try to schedule it during the time he's not available. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dad's available only at 11 on Tuesday? Sorry, uh, Wednesday's all they had. That's Sorry. hilarious. Sorry, dad. Yeah, it's uh, dads oh, Dads are deal killers. They really are. Well, I mean, you think about it. It is the, the perspective of, you know, the dad coming in. It's his job, right? Number one, it's like he's going to be protective of his kids. And he's going to, um, he's going to flag anything that he feels like is a concern. Uh, because he's kind of like wants to feel important. We would do the same thing. We're dads. I would. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this. I was like, would I be that dad? And I'm like, I kind. I think I would. You would. Because I think my kids don't know anything about yeah. a house, and I've got all this experience, and I've dealt with all these problems in a house, and so I can go find out if there's a problem or not. So you asked if I had an inspection uh, story before the episode. Yeah. I do have one. It's okay. not necessarily a, a nightmare story. It's a, it's not at all actually. But um, this is where I wanted dad to show up. So okay. we had we had some clients. My wife and I had some clients that were going to buy a place, and honestly, we were they were first time home buyers, and we were questioning whether they should buy this place. We're mm -hmm. like, "Hey, look, it's got a lot of issues. Like, mm -hmm. are you sure this is what you want to tackle as a first time home buyer?" And we warned them so yeah. many times, and we want Dad to show up. Right, nitpick this thing to death, Dad. Right, Dad made it over. He tried to talk some sense into this couple. It wasn't happening. And they bought the place, and and it all worked out fine. But it's just one of those situations where you're like, this is a big project, right? And I'm not sure you really want to tackle this as a first time home buyer, right? Even though it's like, yeah, you know, you're going, okay, I know you're ambitious, and I know that you want to fix her up, or but maybe you don't want this big of a project at this point in your life. Yeah, I mean, it was a big project, yeah. and I'm sure it'll work out just fine. And and they really wanted it, and we did our due diligence by, you know, saying all these things and bringing all these things to light um, to be, you know, good to our clients. But it's just something they really wanted to do. And sometimes, you know, what they want is, you know, ultimately what happens. Well, I mean, the reality of it is you can't keep the dad from showing up. Okay. Yeah, you can't. So, but it's how do you handle dad when he shows up? Now, what my goal is, is to build some rapport and some trust with the dad. And the way that I do it is not trying to hide anything from him. You know, typically if I'm going into a house for like showings, I'm 
you know, while my clients are like, I don't like lead my clients by the hand and be like, Hey, look how great this kitchen is. And look how great this, uh, uh, you know, living area is, or the master bedroom. I don't do any of that. They're going to find that on their own. So I go through and I go look at the air conditioner, hot water heater. I go, um, I remember this in, um, Oklahoma specifically because they had, um, you don't, you have slab in Oklahoma most of the time. So you don't have crawl space. And so you'd have to like, I would open the vents to see if there's any rust or sand in the vents, because that was an indicator that there's potentially, uh, uh, the ductwork is not functioning properly. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm looking at, I'm looking at potential problems. And so when dad shows up, I'd be like, Hey, I just want to show you a couple of things that I found, um, that I was concerned about, you know, we can figure this out. Now, the reason I'm doing that is just to build trust with dad. If you don't do something like that and you're trying to like, Oh, I don't want him to see anything. He's going to sense it. And, you're going to build a barrier between you and him. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the times that dad has come on our inspections, that's exactly what I do. I go ahead and notate how old the HVAC is, how old the water heater is, mm-hmm. all those things. And I, I go ahead and write down the dates and I'll be like, when he shows up, be like, hey, because that's usually the first thing dad asks is like, how old's the HVAC? Right. You're like, hey, I already looked at the HVAC. Here's the dates. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and usually, like you said, that instantly builds rapport. Like, all right, this guy knows yeah. what he's doing and, you know, you move on from there. Well, right. The other thing that I'll do is make sure I say, hey, whatever you find here, just let me know. I'll notate it and we'll talk about it during this. So, you know, I, I want to give him, uh, uh, I, I don't want to keep him from doing anything because he's going to do it anyway. So I just want to build trust there. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would do. Okay. The other thing that comes up uh, is like code and permitting. And where this comes up is, you know, that inspector that's coming, he is not a code inspector. And also a lot of people have this sort of, um, they've heard the term, it needs to be up to code. Well, if you've got an older house, it was built to code at the time, yeah. but it may not be up to current code and you're not going to get it up to current code without spending a ton of money. It's yeah. not really a concession. So if you're going as like, well, I want all the electrical to be to be up to code. It's just not going to happen. Electrical is the biggest one. That yeah. one's usually, you know, especially houses around here in Franklin, those, yep. those are never going to be up to code unless they've been like significantly reno- renovated in the last. Well, know, and even that, it's like a lot of your, your house flippers and things like that. They're not going to, because they're trying to maintain a profit margin. You like, if you take on a, uh, you know, bring in the electrical up to code, that's like 20 grand. Yeah. I mean, it, it needs to be a luxury property for you to even think about doing that and you need to have bought it. So even when you're going into flipping situations, they're probably not going to have things up to code if you're expecting that. And they're probably not going to have things uh, permitted either. Now, there was an, uh, a neighborhood in Oklahoma called Nichols Hills. And if you had a contractor show up at that house, it was a luxury neighborhood. If you had a contractor in your driveway, you had to have a permit. And they had people scanning the neighborhood on a daily basis to make yep. sure that everything that was happening is being permitted. However, for the majority of the United States, that's not the case. And so when people say, oh, well, you know, did you make any repairs without permits? The answer is probably yes. Um, even though it's not going to say so on the disclosure and people just don't understand it. But um, yeah, the permitting thing is, um, some some places, some neighborhoods will have it, but I think it's the exception rather than the rule. And most things are just going to happen without a permit. You just have to be ready for that. Yeah. Usually if they got a permit, it was something obvious that they were doing on the exterior of the home that, you know, right. that they would have been, you know, kind of shut, the project would have been shut down if they didn't get a permit or something. Yeah, or they're ripping out the insides yeah. or something like that. Like basically reconstructing the house, but people aren't going to pull a permit for even like removing a wall or something. A lot of times they won't do it. No. Okay, so just know that that's a real thing. And if you're, if you're thinking that you're, if your buyers are thinking that they're going to come and negotiate, Hey, bring it up to code. And I want permits for all these repairs. You're going to, that's going to be a deal killer yep. most of the time. Yep. Um, this is for uh, new agents. I would recommend that you attend the first three, four, five inspections um, from start to finish, just so you kind of get an idea. Number one of how it works. And number two, the terminology because as you're working through these um, scenarios and these repairs and these things that come up, you're going to hear some uh, commonalities from house to house. And then that's going to basically up your experience level, up your knowledge and help you uh, solve, help you solve problems for your clients. Yeah. Once you've done three or four of them, I, what I do is I call the inspector and I say, Hey, look, g- give me a call when you're 30 to 45 minutes from being done and I'll roll in 
as he's wrapping up. And so we can all have a conversation in the driveway as we're leaving. Um, did you find anything that concerns you, stuff like that? So you can have it in person and then, right. you know, you can have a, you know, virtual call later with when you have the report in hand, but just anything he notated that we wanted to talk about in person, that's usually what I do. Yeah. And another thing is I would also have a conversation with your clients that when the inspector shows up, look, you, you follow him around like a puppy dog is just going to make it go slower, right? He's going to give you a full report with pictures and then he'll even let you, if you've got a great inspector, you can call and ask specific questions. Yep. Right. And he'll pull up the report and say, yeah, this is what I found. Yeah. The guy I use always offers the phone call with the buyer after the report's been delivered. He offers it every time. And uh, so that I think that's great. I think it makes the, the buyers feel better, too, knowing yep. that they can ask these questions. OK, moving to the uh, resolution period or repair amendment period. Um, th these are called different things in different states, but basically it's the uh a document and period of time that you have to negotiate on what repairs are going to be done or not. Again, we want to go towards the major things, not the deferred maintenance, the major items as a, as a primary uh, request to the clients. And um, uh, so we, we want to do that. So one of the first things is like, Hey, let's, let's ask for these items. The other thing is if it is a major item, let's get quotes from professionals Um you know, HVAC guy, you need to have an HVAC guy and say, hey, how much is it going to cost to fix this? Um, so that way you've got some knowledge. And the more information that you can gain in terms of like how much is this going to cost, it's going to make the negotiation go so much easier because you can't negotiate on unknowns. It makes it really, really difficult. And I've seen people do that. Well, they're going to fix this or they're going to fix that. If we don't have a cost, uh, a price attached to it, it just makes it really difficult because yeah. people always they are scared of what it might be. And I've seen it work on both sides of the coin where somebody comes in and it's like, oh, that's six or $700 worth of work and it's mm -hmm. 10,000. Right. Or come in and say, that's yeah, $10,000 worth of work and it's four or 500. So it works on both sides. Get a quote from a professional, especially when you're dealing with, you know, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, all these things, um, roof, all that. Just make sure you have a quote in hand because it's going to really speed up the negotiation process. Yeah. So again, you know, you're going to have the inspection and then right after that, if the inspector says, Hey, these are some kind of red flags here. The follow-up is to get the professionals out there to give you bids on the work to be done. Um, that way. And so I would even err on the side of extending the inspection period to make sure that you've got actual dollar figures that you're working with so that you can negotiate. We've always talked about keeping in touch with the listing agent. This is the time to do that. So if you've gotten an inspection, you've gotten it done pretty quickly, let's say two or three days in, and you have a seven-day inspection window, but you think you're going to need a couple of professionals out, mm -hmm. go ahead and call the listing agent and be like, hey, I know we said seven days. I'm thinking I might be able to get that wrapped up, but there might be an inspection or two that, that extends out. Are you going to be okay if we extend it out to 10 days? Go ahead and lay that groundwork now because if you wait until day seven and then ask for it, they're probably going to be like, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, get ahead of it. Okay. Um, and yeah, again, if it's uh, if it's a major rep repair item, just don't put yourself in a, in a place where you're guessing because that's going to come back to bite you. Yeah. Um, okay. What if something's old but working? How do you handle that? Old but working? Yeah. Um, uh, give an example of what you're asking. So like I say... I, the, the air conditioner is 20 years old, but it still works. Uh, I, you know, I would be, if it's working just fine and it's been given like the green light, I would probably just ask for some sort of concession that's not equal to fully replacing the unit. Yeah. Yeah, you, you do. And one of the things that you can do is, you know, on those <clears throat> things, like, cause people get the, you know, the inspector will say, Hey, you need to budget for this cause it could, you know, break next year. It could break in five years. It could go another 10. I've seen air conditioners last a long time. Yep. But what happens is, you know, you've got buyers that are like, they, they don't want to absorb, absorb that expense. And so they get scared and they think it's going to break tomorrow. Uh, but that's part of home ownership. And yeah. so what I'm typically commuting my, communicating to my clients is like, hey, look, you can do things to um, decrease the risk, like you're getting a home warranty, right? To decrease the risk in case something breaks. Uh, but by and large, if it's broke, we, if it's not broke, we don't need to fix it. Yeah. It needs to be looked at as a complete package too, right? If you're not asking for really anything, but you come across a 20 year old HVAC asking for a little bit of concession, probably not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But if you have buyers that are nitpicking this house to death and then you have a fully functional HVAC, yep. 
you know, you might not ask for anything. So it needs to be, the whole package needs to be looked at together and not just in these onesie twosie items because it's, um, you're going to fill the listing agent out too. Like if it was, um, you'll, you'll be able to understand like, hey, how much can I get away with here? Right, that's right. Um, so yeah, just basically to further your point, don't load up on those deferred maintenance items, right? Because all it's going to look like is nitpicky. And w- this is one of the things that aggravates the fire out of me Okay, if you are a realtor, the buyer's agent, and I'm the listing agent, and you copy and paste from the inspection report, drives me crazy. Because basically you did no work to uh, prepare your clients for this, and then they got into the inspection, and they just go, well, we want everything fixed. Yeah. Well, they're not going to get a new house, okay? Yeah, it's not happening. And even if you did buy a new house, there's probably something that's going to break, right? That's why you have a one-year builder warranty. So... You know, don't don't be the agent that copies and pastes. Make sure that you're preparing your clients, um, and also don't load up because if you load up on a bunch of nitpicky stuff, that's that can be a major deal killer too. Yeah. Um. So, uh, let's see what else. And and ha- again, we always say this, but having that phone call with the listing agent when you're going through this process and not just shooting over a repair amendment that's miles yeah. long is is going to be it's going to be in your favor. Well, you know, we've talked about this in previous episodes, but get on the same team. You guys are on the the team that is getting the deal closed, right? Um, So, you know, get on the same team. You guys work together to solve these problems, right? Don't get contentious. Um, Work together to solve them. Okay, so we've got... um, Getting into submitting the request. Oh, submitting the requested repairs. Um, Where was I going with that? I mean, honestly, this is, I would always try to negotiate with oh, dollars yeah. and not with actual repairs. I, the people moving out are just going to get it fixed to be done with it and right. move on. They're probably not going to hire licensed professionals. They're going to get the lowest bid they can. It could potentially be shoddy work. Yep. You're not going to be happy with the repair, but it's going to be a box that was checked negotiate with dollars so you can get your own repairs done it the downside to that is it's probably not going to be done pre-close unless you're talking about a roof or something they allow you to work on it beforehand because they know they're going to have to do it anyway but it's probably not going to be done before close you're going to have to deal with it after but it's going to be someone that you pick and it's going to be something that you dealt with and you understand and you know you've negotiated on your own so i would always negotiate with dollars and i think that's where you were going with this. that's absolutely right so yes you, you, there's a natural dissonance between the buyer and the seller, right? To your point, it's like sellers like, uh, I'm leaving tomorrow. And the buyer's like, I'm going to live here for 150 years. Yeah. So I want the very best. So you've got this like already going to be a tug of war. Um, so yes, there, you want to try to work it out with dollars, but there are a couple of ways to do it because you know, you can't like the seller cannot give the buyer money. Okay. Right. So you, it, it's illegal. It's like mortgage fraud, technically, right? Yeah, we wouldn't want to see something like that. No. Yeah, because basically that means they're financing, you know, the the mortgage company's like, yeah. well, I'm not financing the repairs. Yeah, right? that's why if you're actually selling personal property, it goes on a bill of sale outside of any contract, outside of anything that the lender would ever see. Correct. Same same concept. So, um, so yeah, you're not going to give them money. So there are two ways that I typically look at to solve this problem. Number one is you can contribute towards the buyer's closing costs, okay? Now, all you would do is work up an addendum or an amendment, depending on what state you're in, that says seller to um, pay X amount of uh, X dollars of buyer's closing costs to include prepaid escrows, origination fees, and other allowables, okay? That's the best and easiest way. The one caveat I'll add is depending on the loan product and you need to talk to your lender, there is a max on the amount of closing costs that the seller can contribute. Correct. between 3 and 6% usually. Uh, just depends on the product and the situation, but you need to find that out before you write something in, so you don't go over that and cause loan issues. Anyway, exactly. Yeah, going. you can't go like, "Hey, we're going to contribute fifty thousand dollars till the buyer's yeah. closing costs." Like, there's not fifty thousand dollars worth of closing costs. Yeah. So yes, you do need to know what that number is. Uh, I would say in most cases you're going to come in under it, uh, but that's something worth thinking about. The other one, okay, the other way to potentially solve this problem is for the sellers to basically to find major items. And have the sellers um, uh, write checks, or not write checks, but basically checks cut from closing to those contracting companies for the work to be done. That's right. So that comes from seller proceeds. So that's different. You can you can put that on the Alta, yep. right? We can see a, that. Yeah. Yep. 
So it's a seller proceeds to fix this thing, but it's not but it's not financed. The the benefit here, and sometimes this, this one works actually a little bit better than just straight up closing costs. And the reason being is they know you're actually asking for dollars that are going towards repairs. Sometimes people think, hey, they want $10,000 repair money and they're actually just putting it in their pocket. Mm -hmm. So like I, they're hesitant to do that. But if you're willing to negotiate where it goes straight to the contractor of your choice, they're like, all right, well, they're actually fixing products. Usually people are more amenable to working that out, but not always. Right. So yeah. And yeah, notated as coming from seller proceeds. Okay. And all of that said, there are probably going to be scenarios where your clients are just going to want to have it fixed before closing. So when that comes up and you have to get contractors over there and we've got, they need to be licensed, all of that stuff, right? And that's going to be notated on their repair amendment um, or the TRR if you're in Oklahoma. Okay. But just be specific on what's going there. Because if you say replace the air conditioner, well... They could put a two-ton unit in. It needs a three and a half. Exactly. Or, you know. We need to talk about specifics, like how many tons, what's the brand that we're going to put in. So we're going to put a two and a half in a train, you know, X1500, okay? Or if it's a roof, this is another one I've seen on the roof. If if you say, well, I just want the roof replaced. Well, you can get three-tab shingle, which is basically like rolling out a piece of paper. Yeah. Or you can get a, a, shingle, a composite. Yeah, years, exactly. Yeah. It's like shingles, we need so. to be specific. So make sure that you go into the specifics of what your clients are, or what's going to be best for your clients um, in that case. And again, you know, be reasonable. You know, you're not going to get, you know, like if it's a roof, a 30 year roof is probably fine. You don't need to get a, span, a tile roof. Yeah. Right. Or a hundred year roof. Just you guys talk through that, but full solar panel. Yeah, full solar panel. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Be reasonable, okay? Um, so, yeah, be specific. And then the other one is you you probably, if you are going to have those contractors do repairs, the buyers are probably going to pay another 150 bucks for the inspector to come do another once through before closing just to make sure things were done and then they're, you know, they're in, they're working, okay? So you'll have that follow-up or, or re-inspection after the completion of the repairs. That's just to cover yourself as the buyer's agent. So make sure you do that. Yep. Okay. And last, um, one more thing yeah. on the reinspect. Don't, don't pass on the final inspection of the home. That's usually one to three days before close, especially if you're negotiating repairs that are going to occur before, you know, before the end of the close, before the close period. Make sure to reinspect it. Make sure that everything was repaired as you indicated. Make sure that the house wasn't damaged significantly on the move out, something like that. Just make sure you do that final walkthrough. Don't skimp on that. Don't right. just say, ah, we're so close. Let's just skip that and go. No, to go, go right, do it. Go do it. Because the other thing is something else could break in the interim too. Yeah. So. And, and anything like you could have a busted pipe, water running down the walls. And, I've seen it, man. Day of, day yeah. of closing, something breaks or somebody hits something on the way out or they're carrying a cou couch and they, you know, gouge a big hole in the wall. It just happens. I wasn't involved in the transaction, but I've heard a, a story of that um, second floor toilet leak over, you know, down the walls. Um, nobody went to do the final inspection, close, walk into a nightmare. Yeah, just that's a bad All the floors situation. are buckling. You know, it's just, it's not good. So do yep. the final walkthrough. Okay. Now, after this is a, okay, if you haven't been listening to anything, listen to this, because this is going to come up so much as a realtor. Uh, it's unbelievable. Okay. After your house, after your clients move in the house, somewhere between one day and 60 days, something's going to break and they're going to call you and be like, hey, did the sellers know about this? Yeah. And they're going to want the sellers to fix it. Okay. This is why at the closing table, I will tell them this. So this is close to what I will say. Um, I'll say, okay, now after you close in the house, so it is Murphy's Law, something's going to break in the house. The sellers don't know about it. They wasn't premeditated. And it is now your responsibility to fix it. So just want you guys to be aware of that because it, it always happens. People come back. It is not actually you've signed documents that say, hey, it's yours. And the re reason that that is, is because when you go move into a house, you live in that house differently than someone who lived in it before. That's right. So this, so again, like if, you know, for me, for my situation, if I bought a house from uh, a couple, like it's just two people living in the house and I move my family in, which is eight people. The toilets are going to get flushed more. The water's going to get run more. And so new problems might arise. Mila's going to be hanging on this <laughs> chandelier. 
Okay, I do have to tell that story. Maybe you cut this out later, but um, we went to stay at a lake house, your lake house, and uh, Mila was oh, two. I forgot about this. Mila was two at the time. Yeah, I forgot about this. <laughs> and um, I don't. He it was a barn door, right? One of those on. Yeah, sliding and somehow barn door. she, it fell off the rail and completely gouged the wall in your new house. Yeah, I felt terrible. Well, I was like, how did that even you happen? You did what any good friend would. You went and found somebody working in the neighborhood and fixed it. I wasn't that's worried true. about that. I I was, the first thing I asked you was what? Is Mila okay? Yeah, that's so, true. I mean, you like, honestly, you know, holes in the walls. But I have two boys. You don't think I've seen a hole in the wall or two? <laughs> um, usually it's a head. I just felt bad because it was a brand new house, you know? Anyway. Yeah, that's fine. But anyway. yeah, that's, uh, you, you're going to live in it differently, especially when you have yeah. eight people or 24 like Brandon. Right, yeah, exactly. So... Just that's why things break because there may be something that the sellers didn't even use for like it's like a yeah. well we didn't even use that uh, pool for two years or hot tub or whatever the case may be. Uh, and how many people have you talked to that's like I don't even go upstairs in my house <laughs> I got all these rooms up there. So, exactly yeah. how how would I know? Yeah. So you're, you're not going to come back afterwards and sue anybody. It wasn't failure to disclose. Like so, so when I'm talking to those clients and say hey, look it's going to break and it is now your responsibility to fix it. Uh, it wasn't premeditated by them. It wasn't failure to disclose. It's just because you're going to live in it differently. Yeah. At the closing table, it's congratulations and you bought it. So you own yeah. it now. <laughs> you deal with it. <laughs> Do not call me. Yeah. No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, uh, no, I, 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 would I would check it. check in and make sure everything's okay. But uh, I have had so many situations where they're like, well, why didn't we do this? And why didn't... Um, the, the other thing is you, you do need to talk with your clients about a home warranty because I have had that before where clients come and they say, well, um, uh, why didn't we get a home warranty? And I said, well, we talked about you getting a home warranty and you decided not to, but it's worth reminding them of that scenario. So you can kind of go, Hey, listen, um, I've had, cause I'll tell clients this, I've had situations where something breaks within that first 30 to 60 days. It's 500 bucks for a home warranty. So just if you want to, you can still buy a home warranty after. Yeah, it's it's 500 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe 750, depending on the house, but it's 500 bucks. Just, I, I always suggest it yeah. and just let them kind of decide what to do from there. But I would just bring up that scenario. So I may have asked them about the home warranty, but I maybe didn't tell them a story around it. And so they didn't do it. This is going to be one shot, one kill. Get ready for this. It's going to be amazing. I'm just going to tell you. Negative Ghost Rider. <laughs> Pattern's full. Uh, and you have sold a house. Um, oh, I'll start over. Dang it. <laughs> Told you. One shot, one kill. Not possible. Not possible. All right. Here we go. Treatments, repairs, and replacements document. Um, God, I'll start that over. You were so far in. I was really far in, but I just didn't know where I was going with it. It could, like, it... There was like a wheel that went off the rails and then the whole thing started to go off the rails. And then I was like, oh, God, please make you it have stop. derailed. You have derailed. <laughs> just try, I'm just trying to get uh, acknowledge my space here. Like, are just you, get, are I'm you just getting my space. No, no, it's fine. I'm just, I'm just getting used to it. By the way, I mean, save this, save this uh, for quick reference because this is going to come up a lot um, uh, in in the in the course of your real estate career. So these are, um, you know, really good tips from people who have done. We've gone through just about every scenario you can think of on the inspection and repairs, and so um, yeah, save this and and come back and listen to it. But again, number one, make sure your buyer. You, I, I can't say this in, enough emphatically make sure that they know how it works. Um, make sure you've got a great inspector um, and uh, and look for the major repairs, not the deferred maintenance. Um, make sure that the repair amendment, um, you know, get quotes from professionals, right? Uh, don't, um, don't guess on uh, major repair items. Um, and then don't load up on those just deferred maintenance items that are minor in nature. Like just try to get to the big stuff and, and use it as a, your negotiation strategy. Yeah. If you can negotiate with money and, uh, if you do have to have contractors come do the work before closing, make sure that they're specific 
right, with what needs to be repair, repaired and replaced. And then finally, make sure you uh, talk with your clients at the closing table about, hey, what happens if something breaks? Give them instruction. That's going to save you a lot of headaches. So do the final walkthrough. Do the final walkthrough. That's absolutely right. Okay, guys, thank you for joining us this week. We'll be back with you next week. Have a great one. Talk to you soon.